Hey, Mr. Pond Boss, <laughs> tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello, everybody. Bob Lust, the Pond Boss, coming at you live Wednesday here at Pond Boss World Headquarters in beautiful uh, Gordonville, Texas. I haven't been hanging around here a whole lot, but I've been hanging around here some. I see uh, Jason Nipstad's already checking in. Of course, we knew he would. Got to talk to Jason today. I'm going to share a little bit of that conversation with you here just for a second. <clears throat> now, bear with me. I got a little raspy throat going on, but I, I've got some cough syrup. Let's see, Bill Robinson, Billy Bates. What's up, Bob? I tell you a lot of stuff up. It's crazy, man. It's um, When people ask me how I'm doing, I tell them I'm leading a pretty cool life. How about you? Because I do lead a really cool life. Mike Cottrell. There's Kim Moore. Hey, Kim. How you doing? Mike's, I, I don't know if he's hanging around uh, Tarrant County or Palapena County. I bet he's in Tarrant County. There's Vito. Hola, Vito. Bill Monica. Hey, buddy. Now, there, now, this guy's a sunfish angler right here. He's a, um, a great musician and an even greater angler. Or maybe he's not. Maybe he's a better musician. Troy Todd, good to see you, buddy. Billy Bates, good gosh, we got a good group showing up already. Danny Max here. Look at there, Tony and Lowell Bennett. Happy Wednesday. We cannot wait to get our pond built. I, I can't wait for you, man. <coughs> Mike Cottrell just got in from dropping off Dave Davidson's deer head. Oh, that's so cool. I love Dave Davidson. He's... He and I go way, way, way back. We first met, holy cow, it had to be in the late 1990s, probably. Anyway, he's got property near Bowie, Texas. There's Trey Carpenter from down around Burnett, Texas, checking in. Devin Thompson. Hey, Devin. Chris Arthur, Steve Scanlon from Peaster. I don't know where Peaster is. Mineral Wells. Hey, who knew that, right? Brock Wren. Hey, Brock, good to see you, buddy. Debbie and I have been staying in a hotel in Allen, Texas for a few days. And uh, <clears throat> a couple of nights, she she kind of cranked down the air temperature in the room a little bit and dried it out, and I slept with my mouth open. And now I have to pay for it. Brock got 750 pounds of crawfish in his 10-acre lake. That's good. Looks like most got smoked. Well, that means your bass are hungry. Jennifer Reeves, hey, from over near Walnut Creek. Well, I know right where that is. That's right over there, right around the corner. John Funk, April in Michigan. You can't beat it. It's doing the forecast for Thursday. Yeah, it'll be 75 the day after. <coughs> There's Dustin Crawley. I got to talk to Jason Nepstad today. And uh, I don't know, probably three years ago, four years ago, uh, I was in that neck of the woods. He's over there at Fayetteville, North Carolina. And he lives on about 125, 130-acre lake. And uh, they were getting ready to draw the lake down, and he wanted to go in and analyze the fishery before they drew the lake down and see what they could do to make the fishery better. So, uh, made a big circle through the United States, got the electric fishing boat over there, spent time with him, and one thing that really jumped out at me about that lake was it was sorely missing some habitat. Well, while we were there, we collected all the data to map the bottom of the lake, and uh, Justin Stain, fisheries biologist, put the map together and got a bottom bathymetry map, they call it. And there's a fancy word for you, bathymetry, where basically it, it creates the contours of the bottom of the lake. So one of the things that uh, Jason wants to do is improve the habitat. So our discussion was, he says, I want to sit down with you, look at the map together, and let's figure out how to create a habitat plan. So when I'm thinking about a habitat plan, the what goes through my mind is is we want to have we want to create an underwater community for our fish. Now, if you're a bass angler, <coughs> to you that means you want to get some congregation points where bass can come together and you can catch them. Well, to me, I know it takes, and y'all know this, y'all know this. How many pounds of bait fish does it take for a bass to gain a pound? 10. That's right. So if you're not providing habitat for those fish that are your forage fish, you're getting behind. <coughs> so we know that fish need a place to spawn and different species of fish spawn different ways. 
A bass spawns differently than bluegill. Bluegill spawns differently than a threadfin shad. Threadfin shad spawn differently than a gizzard shad, which spawns differently than a, a red ear sunfish. So we need to know how all those fish reproduce, provide that for them, and that's part of the habitat. The second part of the habitat is when a, a baby fish is first hatched from its egg, it's not very big. Like a little baby bluegill is this big. T90 little squirt. 12,000 of them weigh one pound. So our job is if we can keep them alive for 45 days, they're 30 per pound. So you do that by providing them places that they can hide and congregate and get away from whatever wants to eat them at that moment. You know, so we can keep them alive a little bit longer. If we can keep them alive a little bit longer, they're a better food source. You know, and then there's uh, the intermediate size fish. You know, the three to five inch bluegill, six to eight inch bass, 10 to 12 inch bass, 14 to 16 inch bass, you know, seven to nine inch bluegill. <coughs> so we want to create the kind of habitat that allows those fish to thrive. Now, the problem with a lake that's 125 acres it's, it's going to be, it takes about 20 to 30% of a lake bed covered with a variety of habitat elements to create the communities to influence the productivity of that lake. Now, when I say the word productivity, it means to grow more fish than it would without all those elements. Well, the thing about a lake that's that big, you know, it's, it'll cost $150,000 to to go create all that habitat if it wasn't created when the lake was built. So when I'm talking to Jason, it's as much about how do we congregate the fish that are there to make them a little easier to catch as we improve the productivity over a long period of time. So what I told Jason was to look at the contours of his bathymetry map and, on, and, and, and print the map out and, and take a marker, Crayola uh, map colors, and mark on the map where you catch the most fish. Or if you've got one of those newfangled depth finders that show you the fish, <coughs> mark that on the map. Mark it exactly where you catch those fish or where you mark those fish. And you're going to find that it's only going to be about 10% of the lake on any given day. And then take that 10% of the lake and improve it first. Whether you're buying mossback fish attractors, you're adding brush piles, rock piles, tire reefs, whatever it is you're going to do, you know, create and, and, and implement and um, enhance those. I, and, and I label those as A zones. So I want to work on the A zones first. They've already proven to be good places to fish. Make them better. If you do that, you're going to attract more fish. Then over a long period of time, you can create enough underwater habitat structure cover to actually make the lake more productive. So that's kind of where we went there with that. Let me see here. <coughs> Y'all are going to have to put up with my coughing tonight. Sorry. Throat's dry. I do have some cough syrup. There we go. Let me see here. Who we got? Okay, Andy Eddings from Signal Mountain, Tennessee. John Funk, yep, Dustin and Crawley. Matt Marsden, listening from the Houston Fishing Show. Matt Marsden is the American Fish Tree Habitat guy. Check out American Fish Tree. Uh, friend, since Matt's watching this show, you can find him right here. Friend him and talk to him about artificial habitat. That's what he's doing over there at the Houston Fishing Show right now. Let's see, I see Ron Ardwan. Good to see him. Oh, gosh, I forgot to do the little commercial thing. Holy cow. <coughs> Everybody that watches this show all the time, you guys know what to do. Click like. Share it to your timeline. Put hashtag Palm Boss Magazine in the comments section. You will be eligible for a drawing for a Palm Boss hat and a Palm Boss mug. And Danny Mac's going to say it. I know. He's already said it. So's Ron. You know, all you guys that watch is your Palm Boss Mug that knows how to keep hot things hot, cold things cold. We don't know how it knows, but it does. Do those three things. Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine. Click like. Share to your timeline. You're eligible for a drawing for all that good stuff. Now, Palm Boss 39. No, not 39. 
35 bucks a year. I guess I can raise the price on it. 35 bucks a year, six issues, cheaper than a Friday night date, and it lasts a lot longer. Hey, and you know what? We got our resources guide out. They're free. Um, to give you more resources, you can go to pondboss.com. We have all these videos archived there. Uh, we've got other videos. The pondboss.com discussion forum called Ask the Boss. You know, by the way, for those of you that don't know, last uh, Wednesday, I launched the Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology online courses. And uh, I'll put up the... Uh, I'll put up a link later on unless one of you guys has it. If one of you guys have it, post that link. It's, I think, pondboss.teachable.com. I think that's what it is. Harrison Davis, good to see you. <coughs> the man, the legend, Palm Boss. Harrison, I, I don't know if you got to watch the show last week, but guess what? You won a Palm Boss hat. You won the drawing last week, dude. So, Leanne, if she hadn't shipped it, she'll be doing that here pretty quick. <clears throat> so anyway, been talking a little bit about habitat. I'm trying to lubricate my throat. Travis Ball Smith, are you going to the Houston fishing show, dude? I know you're in that neck of the woods. Todd Austin, Frank James. Hey, Big Mon. Hey, Big Mon. Mike McPherson, good evening from Indiana. Just want to say thank you for all you do. You're welcome. I feel like a pig on roller skates, but you know what? You step on those roller skates long enough, you'll be chasing all the other pigs and running away faster than they are. Tony Lawrence, you got it. My bass gather at supper time, says John Funk. It's fun to watch them picket line the edge of the pond, waiting. There you go. Frank James, Aquamax 300 and 400, finally came into the Purina store. Good news for my young of the year bluegill in the forage pond. Travis Paul Smith got his Texas Hunter feeders loaded up. Those are two of our really important sponsors, and it's and it's not so much that, that they buy advertising. I think that's great, but more importantly, they cater to our industry. <coughs> they 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 create products that make our ponds better. You know, you guys that watch the show all the time, you've heard this story, but I got to start working with Purina Mills back in 1995. And, it, you know, they bought they bought the inside front cover of the magazine. They've got that every issue, every issue. There it is right there. They've got that ad, and they also have the back cover. Well, that helps fuel our economy. But the thing that really struck me the most was when they looked me right in the eye at Hammond's Barbecue in Glen Rose, Texas in 1995. They said, you know what? Yeah, we want to buy an ad, but... What can we do to help this industry? We see this industry as a burgeoning industry. It's in its infant stages, and we want to do what we can to help. So we started talking about it. I just threw out there, I said, you know what? We uh, we keep feeding different sizes of different species of fish. and they, they might be bluegill this big or this big, or channel catfish this big or this big, and we can only buy one size of fish food. You think you can maybe create different pellet sizes. Oh my gosh, it was like a palm to forehead moment. They looked at each other, there were three of them. And it wasn't two weeks later, I had a pallet of unmarked bags and that's where Game Fish Chow was born. Well, that was in 1995. So Game Fish Chow hit the market because of a conversation with some guys from Purina eating ribs on butcher paper with sawdust on the floor. Now, tell me that's not real. That's as real as it gets. <clears throat> so as time went on, they had the Aquamax lineup of fish foods that they wanted to improve those. So I got to work with Dr. Mark Griffin, who was their nutritionist back then, to, to develop some of the feeds that they used to this very day. And not only did they develop the feeds, they spent time over time over the years making them better, changing the vitamin package, changing the fat, improving the uh, nutrient load, uh, figuring out that fish meal was it. That's the very best protein. Now, I read something on a Facebook page, a pond page today, where a guy was complaining about paying 46 bucks for a bag of fish food. Well, I get that. Sticker shock. Sure, who wants to pay $46 for a 50-pound bag of anything? You know, except gold. <clears throat> but here's the difference. They 
Your 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 carnivorous fish like bluegills, largemouth bass that are feed trained, hybrid stripers, you know those kinds of fish that are carnivores, they have to have meat to gain weight. Well, this fish food they convert it like one point two or one point three to one. Now, Prin doesn't like me saying that because their feed trials where the fish only eat fish food is not quite that good. It's like one point four, but the feed trials that I've done. 1.2 to 1.3, knowing that there's also some natural food in these ponds out here that I did the feed trials on. Now, here's something else. It's when I'm feeding these this fish food to these bluegills, not only do the bluegills get bigger, but they have a lot of babies. So I might start off with 1,000 bluegills in a trial and end up with 15,000 bluegills at the end of the trial. So how do you figure all that out? You know, But here's what I know. <clears throat> is, is is those fish get larger, grow faster, have more babies because that fish food at 46 bucks a bag is doing that for them. And they're not getting that out of a out of a uh, grain-based fish food sack. They're not. And then Texas Hunter, been a long time friend with those guys. I love their products. I love their fish feeders. I love their deer blinds. They make a lot of cool stuff. But their feeders will throw that fish food 40 feet out in a straight line. Fish can't say no to that. You know, also, uh, David Schneiderman, Easy Docs of Texas, he's a he's a sponsor of this show, as is Greg Grimes with Aquatic Environmental, lakework.com. Okay, look at there. Here, look at there. Here comes David Ewald. David Ewald's also got now... David doesn't buy an ad from me, but we're going to forgive him for that for this moment. He should buy an ad. He knows it, but he's, he's posting this thing up here, and I usually delete those, but David, I'm going to cut you a little slack tonight so you can get in here and compete. If you guys want to take a look at what David's doing, and David, you need to buy an ad. That's all I'm going to say about that, but I'm going to leave your post up and let people take a look at it because you've been in the industry a long, long time. <clears throat> and and your products stand on their own merit. Let's do it that way. David Ewald's products stand on their own merit. All right, looky here. Mark Hicks, good to see you. Jeff Thompson, why does blue-green algae slow down the activity of bass feeding? Um, by the way, Jeff is one of the guys, one of the early birds that bought into the Bob Lusk Institute of Hyropondology. And Jeff, I appreciate that. I saw that. <coughs> and uh, I'm going to be sending you a uh, Palm Boss hat. I've got Leanne queued up to do that. But to answer your question, I'm not convinced that blue-green algae slows down the activity of bass feeding. I think it's coincidental. Because typically when a pond has blue-green algae, the temperatures are going up and bass are seeking a thermal refuge. Now, if that's going on now... I don't necessarily think those two things are related. Now, what blue-green algae does is let's let's do it. Let's go to school on that for a few minutes. Blue-green algae is caused by an imbalance between nitrogen and phosphorus in the water, and it's because of the blue-green algae, which is actually a bacteria. It's not an algae at all. It's because they are out competing all the good algae and the good plankton. And it's because of the circumstances. <coughs> the circumstances are the right temperature. A nutrient imbalance could be the temperature rose or the temperature fell and, and, and knocked out those better algaes and plankton that compete with blue-greens. But the circumstances are where that blue-greens can, can grow. Now, those may be the same circumstances that disrupt bass's behavior, but it's not a symbiotic or it's not a mutually exclusive cause for one over the other. So that's the answer I'm going to give you there. Mike McPherson, Jennifer Reeves. You guys know the drill. Mark Hicks, cheaper than a Friday night date. Yeah, oh, come on, dude. 35 bucks. I took Debbie to BJ's, which is a brewery, over there in Allen, we're staying in a hotel over there. I spent 42 bucks for lunch. That was an appetizer, soup and salad, uh, and we each had a glass of wine for lunch, which we don't do that very often, but that was like 48 bucks. 
And it was gone. Gone. Adios. Like, see it. 35 bucks. And I promise you, you'll get a nugget out of each one of these issues. And some of you will get two nuggets. And others will get more. <clears throat> so there's my commercial for the moment. Let's see here. Billy Bates, I sent you a couple of pics in an email. I'm, oh, yeah, okay. Yep, yep, yep. I'm seeing these eye worms and flukes in about 10% of my young of the year bluegills. Pretty crazy parasite with its life cycle, which involves snails. Plan to increase shell crackers in my pond to help help eat more. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Whoa. Holy cow. I'm getting behind. I'm going to have to catch up. Okay, so Billy, I'm trying to read the rest of this. What else can be done? Okay, all right. You know what? Okay, Billy Bates. <coughs> what happens is there's these worms, these flukes that the primary host are, are uh, and actually there's um, grubs, yellow grubs and black grubs. Snails are the primary host. And so what happens is the snails host the parasite. Why do you have snails? Answer that question and you'll have your answer for the long term. When you have snails, you have, usually have abundant vegetation, sometimes too much vegetation. Snails will thrive, reproduce, grow, feed, and just do really well in uh, patches of aquatic plants. So if you can minimize the... Now, you don't want to do away with aquatic plants, but the reason you want shell crackers is because they eat snails. So they go in there and they disrupt the life cycle of these parasites by eating the snails, which is the primary host. What happens is the cercaria, whoo, that's two big words in one, one broadcast, break loose or, or hatch from the snail, free swimming, attached to a fish. And the ones that Billy's talking about, these snails, they, they'll, they'll come in the back of the eye of the, of the, especially bluegills. I've seen them in bluegills several times, actually many times. And then they'll burrow their, themselves into the eye and then they'll start forming, they'll just start growing really big. Well, you can take a pair of tweezers and pluck them out of the eye. I've seen I've seen those dead gum round worms like that that long coming out of an eye of a bluegill that was this big. What else can be done is manage the aquatic plants and be sure that you have survival rates of your of your shell crackers, which are also called red ears. <clears throat> In Louisiana, all you boys, Ron, and um, all you other running buddies from South LA, they're also called chinkapin perch. Holy cow, I need to catch up. Y'all hang with me. Travis Paul Smith got a message from Mr. Sean, Dr. Sean McNulty, by the way. Waiting on tiger bass. Yeah, yeah. Well, they've hatched. Now they're letting the fry grow up to be a marketable size to get as many of them on fish food as possible. <coughs> Mike Fornash just finished doing using a Pond Master test kit on my one acre. 17-year-old pond. What do you recommend the pH, ammonia, nitrate, and phosphate levels to be? Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to say here. What I'm going to tell you is you want your pH to be between 6 and 8. Uh, ammonia, you want it to be less than one part per million. Nitrate is going to change with the moment. Phosphorus, less than 0 0.04 in order for it to not be a nuisance. Phosphate levels change because phosphorus changes. But here's, with your water chemistry, here's what you want. <clears throat> you want your pH to be, be between 6 and 8. 7 is neutral. Um, it's okay if it's a little bit more, a little bit less. It's just not ideal. And you want your alkalinity to be at least 40 parts per million or higher up to about 180 or 200 parts per million. There's Kelly Hart. I got to spend time with Kelly yesterday. Kelly's building a really cool about 8-acre lake up in central Oklahoma. And he's got his dam about a third of the way through. And our the mission yesterday was to figure out his habitat plan. Now, he's got like three fingers of creeks that come in <coughs> to, to a confluence where they're digging soil out to make the bowl of the lake. And our job yesterday, I mean, and now Kelly has gone in and cleaned out some brush and set flags where the water level is going to be. So that's part of the process of doing this is you got to get the site clear enough that you can move dirt, figure out where the dam is going to be, and then if you can set flags where the water line is going to be, then you can begin to visualize what's going to be that horizontal plane of the lake. And then you got to make decisions on what to do below the water line, because like with, with Kelly, he's going to have a whole bunch of trees that are going to get flooded. Well, if he wants standing dead timber, 
He doesn't do anything with them. If he wants to remove some, he should. Some of them he'll save like eight to 10 inch caliper trees that aren't way too, too big and too tall. Perfect for fish structure. He's got several places on his property with big rocks, rocks as big as uh, half the size of the bed of a pickup. And he's going to take some of these rocks and use them as landscaping fixtures, fixtures and other rocks to create rock piles in water five to eight feet deep. So that, that's he, he's working on his habitat plan. And I'm going to draw him a map and write some things up. This week I'm in, on the road. Mark Dyer, howdy from Nebraska. Love the content. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris Arthur, typically how long does it take fingerlings to find the fish food after they're released into a pond eight acres? Depends on how many you stocked. <clears throat> like if you stocked um, fingerling bluegills, it's probably going to take them a month or six weeks to find the fish food. So in that case, go ahead and feed them, but just set the feeder to go off if you got two feeders in an eight-acre pond or three feeders in an eight-acre lake, uh, set it to go off for two seconds. Because when they're fingerlings, you know, what that means is with bluegill, they're about that big. You know, they've got a lot of natural food. Especially, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming we're talking about a brand new lake. That's what I'm assuming. And so they've got enough natural native food, so they're going to do fine. Uh, it's going to take them till they're probably three or four inches long before they really find that fish food. And when they do find it, they're going to peck on it. Now, once they hit about five, four and a half, five, six inches long, then they'll erupt on it. And they'll hit it so fast you can't even see them. They're up, hit, down, up, hit, down. I mean, bam, 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 like that. So it may take six weeks before they really start coming to that fish food. All right. Looks like... Uh, Travis Paul Smith said it took his a week. And it depends, it truly depends on how many fish you stock. Look at there, Matt Marsden and Andy Eddings are becoming buddies. Hey, there's Stan Lee, good friend of mine. Yep, I'm back at the office. I am today. I am right now. I'll be in a hotel here in about two hours. Travis got back from Mexico. Was there four months. Check his text hunter back. You know what? The hog's been getting fed a little bit. Okay. <laughs> We love it. <coughs> Dave Weber from outside of Kansas City. When the boss is at the pulpit. You know, I actually do have a pulpit. Chuck made a pulpit out of cedar. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Thanks for the kind words. Morgan Tyler. Hey, Morgan, I was just singing the praises of Purina uh, Aquamax products. And there's Morgan checking in. Morgan is, he works with Purina Mills. He's... Uh, he really drills in more into wildlife feed, but he knows how to feed a fish too. Oh, Drew Hay must be on here. I see that uh, Ron's telling me hello. Chuck Brinkman checking in. He's, um, somebody's telling me I sound pretty rough. I don't know who that is. Better back up and look. I do sound pretty rough because my dad gum wife put the thermostat on 63 degrees in the hotel room. Next morning, I had a dream. I thought I saw some meat hanging from one of the dead gum light fixtures in there. I want to back up and make sure I'm covering all this stuff. Yep. You know, when I'm listening to the radio, I don't want to hear dead air, and I know you don't either, but let's see here. I'm coming on down, coming on down, and getting back where we were. Oh, yep. Debbie Dobbs Lusk, you sound pretty rough. Honey. My throat's been a little bit grizzled, just a little bit grizzled. And uh, if Sawyer's, tell Sawyer to keep watching me. Tell Sawyer, Pop, hey, Sawyer, who loves you, baby? Papa loves me. That's my deal with all the grandkids. I say, hey, who loves you, baby? And their job is to say, Papa loves me. About half the time they say, Memes loves me. Well, we know that. Okay, so honey, I just now saw your post. Let's see here. Coming on down. <laughs> Jeremy Duckworth. Good to see you, buddy. Let's see. Frank James. Bob, I took your advice and began feeding at night to cut back on geese stealing in the pellets. How do the fish respond to night feeding? They get used to it. They don't care. They don't, they don't care if it's dark or light. They know, they know that when that feeder goes off and that feed hits the water, they got a free deal, free meal deal. You know, they're not, they're not punching the time clock. They're not working. They're going to get accustomed to it. 
and they're going to eat it. How do the fish respond? Okay, do the same fish eat it as do, do during the day, or is the night shift a little different? No, no, I tell you what, <clears throat> the night shift won't be different because what happens is you're going to get the feed hogs. So the fish are the most aggressive, fastest growing fish are going to be the first ones to the feeder. Now, once they fill their little bellies up and they disappear, then the rest of the fish will be able to get more feed. So it kind of depends on how much you're feeding. The more you feed up to a point, the more fish that you feed. And uh, it, it, it'll be the same aggressive fish at night as it is during the daytime. I hope I said that convincingly, although I can't prove it. <laughs> Harrison Davis, I know I can go to the University of Google, but why do that when we got the doctor in the house? Why are bluegill called bluegill? Oh my gosh, I got to tell you a story. <coughs> Way back, I don't know, this had to be 2005 or six. I got invited to go to Canada to go fishing. Now back then, Ray Scott and his crew would invite uh, as many people as he could. Of course, I think his deal was if he invited people and put the trip together, his trip was free. So we would fly into International Falls, catch a van across into Canada, show our passports, then the van takes us to a dock, climb on a float plane, and we fly up into the boundary waters to this camp. Well, when I, the very first time I went, I uh, got to International Falls, and I, they, were, they told me to ship my gear ahead, ship it to UPS, and that way I could get it there. It would be ready at the, at the airport, in a, in a hangar somewhere, and uh, it would sa I would save money. <clears throat> so I shipped all my fishing gear up there, and I had just strolled out and found it at the freight dock, and I was carrying it back around to get ready to come on the van, and I see a van coming around, and a 12-passenger van. I look at somebody's going like that. Hey, come here. Me? Yeah, come here. And so the d van door opens, and there's Johnny Morris, the guy that started Bass Pro Shops. He's with Bill Dance. Charlie Campbell, look up Charlie Campbell, with little Jimmy Dickens, look him up, and Porter Wagner in this van. And these are all people that I watched as I was growing up. And so Johnny said, hey, settle an argument. And I said, what is it? He says, why do they call a gizzard shad a gizzard shad? I thought, oh my gosh, <coughs> I better get this right. Because if I miss this in front of these famous people, Oh my gosh, I'll be embarrassed. And I said, well, Johnny, because they have a gizzard. He said, that's what I, I told you guys that. They said, okay, okay, okay. And uh, gizzard shatter called gizzard shat because they have a gizzard. So I'm going to tell you that story because bluegills are called bluegills because they have a... <laughs> Over here, a little blue flap on their gill. And that's it. All that drama to get to that, right? Drew Hay, Billy Bates. Bob, besides you, of course, who do you feel in the foremost expert on bluegill? Who do you trust when it comes to bluegill knowledge? Um. Well, you know what? I think Bruce Condello knows them as much about bluegill as anybody does. I think um, Bobby over at Malone's Fish farm in, in, in um, Arkansas does. Now, <clears throat> basing this on science and experience, because I know that, that Bruce Candelo for about eight or nine years grew bluegills without good fish food, with fertile water, and he would cull and select for the size and the growth rates and then use those fish to keep creating or or manipulating genetics. Now, nutritionists like, um, oh gosh, um, Mark Griffin, I think he knows a lot about bluegill. But now, I can't, I can't say that without talking about people that catch big bluegill. You know what I mean? When you look at Bruce Condello's big bluegill page, there's people all over the country that know how to catch big bluegill. So when it comes to somebody that's the foremost expert on bluegills. You know, it's kind of hard to say who's the foremost expert. If I had to pick one person, I'd probably pick Bruce because I, I know what he's done to learn about them. Now, 
I, I'm, I have to put myself up there with him, although I don't focus on Bluegill as much as he focuses on Bluegill. That gives him an edge. That's probably more time than I needed to spend on that, but there you go. <clears throat> Danny Mac, my anecdotal experience is that fish never feel full, especially channel catfish. No food pellets get left behind. You know what? I like that. And I'll tell you why. Um, when I was uh, when I was in the ninth grade, my parents bought a place on the Brazos River down between Granbury and Glen Rose. And I'll, I'll always remember my favorite times of the year to catch channel catfish in that river was Labor Day weekend. It just so happened that they would let enough water out to have a fairly good flow rate. And fish would be moving, but that's about the time those big yellow grasshoppers were about that big. Now, we'd get a coffee can with a plastic top, and my dad would take his pocket knife and cut an X in the lid. Well, you could take a <coughs> flashlight <coughs> and go out on the sunflowers in the field with that flashlight, and you could pluck those big old yellow grasshoppers off of those sunflowers. We had like three 20 hook trot lines, and we'd go out in a little John boat, pole up and down the river, and we'd go bait the bottom one first, and I'd thread two or three grasshoppers on each hook and then go up. And by the time we finished baiting the third one, we'd go back downstream and start running the trot line. And we'd do that until about two in the morning. And then we go back up and go to sleep. Well, I had a Zebco 33 that, uh, and I had this device that I shoved way down in the sand and I put a grasshopper on about a number two hook and threw it out there with a slip sinker and it, and it, the current was strong enough that it washed it all the way up against the bank. Well, I went to sleep, woke up about six o'clock to go down and, and check the trot lines. So I noticed that my Zebco was bent over double and it was in the middle of the river. So I started reeling that thing in. My little old 14 year old heart was pounding, bam, 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 bam. Reeled that sucker in and I caught the, I caught about a six pound channel catfish with the biggest belly I'd ever seen. Now, of course, when you're 14 and you're me, you hadn't seen that many. So I brought it in and took it up and we cleaned it. And that dadgum channel catfish had eaten a pocket gopher about that big. Swallowed, I guess a gopher, when the river rose, a gopher got washed into the river, catfish swallowed it whole, and then he ate a grasshopper. He wasn't hungry. He was greedy. But I can't tell you how many times I have caught a bass, reeled it in, and there'd be a tail of a big fish sticking out of its gullet, and it still ate something. So what? Uh... So what he's talking about, Danny Mac, is I totally buy into that. Even though a fish is full, that doesn't mean it won't eat. Now what they will do around the fish feeder is they'll come eat that fish food until they're satiated and then they'll move away. But that don't mean they won't come right back in 15 minutes and eat something else. Because they will. Travis is digging a pond. It's going to be 1.25 acres. Going to stock it with 5 to 6, six 5 to 7 inch tiger bass. I want to feed the bass, bass Aquamax 500, 600 primary fish food. How much for it should I stock and what Texas Hunter feeder? Going to grow the bass for the nine acre lake. Well, all right. You know what? Let's take a minute on that. Let's, let's, let's talk about that. I'm going to answer that question directly. I would stock the forage as though you weren't going to feed the bass. Go ahead and stock that five to 10 pounds of fatheads per surface acre or more. You can stock as many as 30 pounds per surface acre in the beginning. Now don't do that afterwards. Do that first. Stock up to 2,000 bluegill per acre because you got to keep in mind that even though you've got, even though you may have two Texas hunter feeders on that small pond, they're only going to go off three times a day for 10 seconds a piece or 20 seconds a piece. That leaves 23 more hours and change for the fish to be eating on their own. You know, and so, um, now, here's the caveat. 
When you're going to take that 1.25 acre lake and you're stocking five to seven inch tiger bass, keep in mind that half of them are boys, half of them are girls. And the half that are girls, about 25 or 30% of those will have the genetic propensity and the aggressive nature to be the biggest of the batch. So out of, if you stock 200 bass, that means that 25 or 30 of them will be the ones that will be the beasts. There'll be another 20, 25 that can grow to be beasts. So out of that, there may be, out of that 200 fish, there may be 50 of them that will be the best of the best if they get the opportunity. So you're going to be calling bass in that 1.25 acre pond if you're growing those fish to put into your nine acre lake. Just keep that in mind. Referencing the bluegill remark, what about red ears? I don't consider anybody an expert on red ears. I don't think there is any expert on red ears. And the reason is, is red, you know, red ears are kind of the stepchildren in the, in the sunfish business. They're looked at more as an insurance policy to assist in the food chain because they spawn between bluegill spawns. And they're an insurance policy because they're stocked to, uh, to eat snails. They're not really stocked to be trophy fish. <clears throat> if they become a trophy fish, it's a byproduct of other trophy fish. With one exception. When you get over into western Arizona, where quagga mussels have gone nuts and, and red ear sunfish grow to be five pounds. Now there's a number of anglers that you could say are expert red ear anglers but they didn't do beans to make those fish grow that big those fish grew that big because they were the most opportunistic most aggressive fastest grown red ear that you could get and they had the opportunity because of all the quagga mussels jerry oler videographer deluxe if you live in the san antonio area or heck, now that there's airplanes have been invented, he'll go anywhere. But Jerry Oler <coughs> is a um, uh, he's a premier videographer. As a matter of fact, some of the videos on the Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology were shot by Jerry Oler, and his contact information is on each one of those. And yes, sir. Hey, Jerry, I'm gonna do this commercial just for you. Thirty-five bucks a year, folks. Cheaper than a Friday night date, and it lasts a year. That's the way it goes. <clears throat> Let's see here. I missed some things. Let me see here. Yep, Travis Paul Smith says, uh, just want to ask everybody to pray for Jimmy Houston's wife. Yes. His bride had a stroke the day after Easter. Uh, he's, um, he's putting up several videos to kind of tell her status. She's regained consciousness. However, they're keeping her sedated. Uh, she had a tracheotomy. Um, her name is Chris. She's in the Bass Fishing Hall of Fame. You know, she is, she is, she is, you know, as you say, your wife is your better half. I think Jimmy Houston can honestly say that. And he's right there by her side. <coughs> Okay, Harrison just wanted to hear one of my great stories. I'm full of stories, buddy. I got a lot of stories. I got some cool stories. So, yes, prayers for Chris Houston. Brian Epting says, so it's okay to stock both red ear and bluegill and tiger? Absolutely. Now, here's your ratios. For every 1,000 bluegills you stock, stock 250 red ears. Because they, uh, they, and, and this, this will make sense to you. <clears throat> Red ear are nicknamed shell crackers because they have these two little bony pads in the back of their throat. So when they eat a snail, they don't chew it up. It goes to the back of their throat and they got these little bony pads that come together and just crush it. Grind it like a grist mill grinds wheat or corn. So, uh, that's how they eat. Now, bluegill don't have that. You know, bluegill got to be able to eat something, swallow it, and then digest it. Where red ear, they can crush it. So they can eat crustaceans. They can, And that's why they get so big over in western Arizona, eastern California, because they're eating quagga mussels. So they can eat these little mussels about so big, 
swallow them, crush them, digest them, and they're the only fish that can do that in that environment. Friday night date goes right. Last a lifetime. John Henry. There's the quote of the day right there. Read him up. Read him up, eat him up. Dion Myers, hashtag Palm Boss Magazine. You guys got it. <clears throat> I was going to tell you a little bit about my travels today, which I think this would this would help you. I got a call from a guy. Oh, I don't know. I, I was referred to him by somebody that referred him to somebody that referred him to somebody to me. So anyway, this guy bought a, uh, a quail hunting ranch over southeast of Paris, Texas. And on the ranch are several lakes. The, the prior owner that the guy he bought it from loves to fish. And so that guy built several lakes. There's probably 40 acres of water, which I haven't, I'll figure that out, but there's probably that much. There's one lake that I bet covers 20 acres and then probably eight or 10 smaller ponds. So in his mind's eye, he's thinking he should take all those ponds and turn them into fishing lakes or fishing ponds. Well, he doesn't really know what he wants other than he knows he's going to entertain people that are quail hunters and he wants to provide them a value added service of being able to catch a few fish. So when I explained to him, you know, what we really need to sit, do, sit down and do is create a master game plan. And what we do there is we need to ask, ask yourself, what are your goals? And specifically, what are your goals about these ponds and lakes? Well, he's got several ponds in a floodplain that about every five or six years are going to flood from a creek. So trying to grow fish in that, if you don't harvest the fish in that year, you're probably not going to get much out of it over the long time, long term. And so with the fishing lakes, there's some ponds that look like they grow fish that you can catch. Some of them look like they won't. So what I told him is let's create a master plan, figure out the user groups, what do they want to catch? How much pressure is there going to be? And then let's look at all these ponds individually. And then let's look at them as a unit. So in other words, we're going to create a fishing program. Now, when I notice I said, I didn't say fish program. I said fishing program. <clears throat> if Realistically, if, if he's got 12 ponds with fish in them, what are the odds that those all those ponds are going to get fished often? Zero. So take some of those ponds and use them to grow forage fish or to grow out fish like what Travis was talking about to grow some of the best of the best to use in the key fishing lakes. So designate which lakes are key fishing lakes and then how can the other lakes and ponds support that with your fishing program. So the next thing we're going to do is, is brainstorm to, to create the goals and then figure out what his expectations are, then come in and evaluate where each one of these bodies of water is, and then come up with a game plan to get from where he is to where he wants to be. Now, that means electrofishing the ponds, that means looking at habitat, that means studying the water, that means figuring out does he have the right food chain. And once we assess all that, then we come up with a game plan that's going to include stocking, habitat improvement, producing the food chain, genetics. So the, the, the take home point for everybody here is, is before you, what, what the first conversation I had with him, he wanted to order a bunch of fish. No, no, no. Let's don't order any fish until we know what it is that you need to do. Then if we need to order fish, let's order fish. I'm all for that. But creating that master game plan is going to be key to the success of him not spending money on the dumb tax. Now, you guys have heard me talk about the dumb tax. We don't know what we don't know. He doesn't know what he doesn't know. So part of my job as his consultant is to teach him the things that he doesn't know so he can make good decisions. So part of that is to create a master plan, set goals, understand your resources, what do you have to work with? You got a budget, employees, equipment, assess what you've got with the fishery and the resources, and then create a game plan to thoughtfully get you from here to here to here to here, and then keep it there. 
So that's the way I think that we need to look at that. Let's see. There's Dion Myers. Good. I saw Dion a while ago. Chris Horsley. <coughs> In an eight-acre bass brim lake, about how many bass should you take out each year? Well, Chris, the the, uh, the general consensus among, among biologists is to harvest between 20 and 30 pounds of bass per, per acre per year. That might be 25 one-pound bass. It might be 43 quarter-pound bass. But... If you'll weigh and measure some of those fish and plug those numbers into a uh, Excel spreadsheet that shows you the standards, if you guys don't have that, email me. I'll send you one. I'll send you an Excel spreadsheet where you can plug in your links and weights and you guys can track that. But the fish will tell you when you're harvesting enough because they'll gain weight. So as long as your fish are above the standard weight of any given length, then you're okay. So, the direct answer is 25 to 40 pounds of bass, 25 to 30 pounds of bass per acre, 20 to 30 pounds of bass per acre. <laughs> so there's your direct answer. The real answer is call enough that the remaining fish continue to grow. It's even more complicated than that because you want to selectively harvest. You don't want to just because a 12 inch bass bites your hook if it weighs 14 ounces, you don't want to take it out. But if you catch a 12-inch bass that weighs 10 ounces, yes, you do. All right, let's see here. Like many, I stocked 20% redder with 80% bluegill. Never seen a redder since. Did they did they start? Yes, they can starve in a new pond. <clears throat> you got to keep in mind that each one of these fish that you stock has got to have happy water. It's got to have the right food chain, great habitat. And if they don't have that, they're not going to thrive. So, if they don't have the right habitat and the right food chain, so if, if, if red ear sunfish don't have the right habitat, which is going to be aquatic plants, because that's where the snails live, if they don't have the right food chain, which is snails, they're not going to thrive. I have actually seen ponds where, where red ear sunfish have thrived and bluegill didn't. But most of the time it's the other way around because there's not enough of the right habitat with the right food chain for a red ear sunfish to thrive. Harrison Davis is throwing out a little bit of his wisdom there. You got to catch him close to the bottom. Red ear sunfish do tend to, to hunker closer to the bottom. They're not quite as aggressive as bluegill are for the most part. And they're usually hanging out in that vegetation. Let's see, Frank James has got something here. Frank from Louisiana. Bob, I read about fast-growing bluegill red ear sunfish hybrids in an article in the March-April Palm Boss Magazine. Do you have any experience with these fish? Are they available for stocking somewhere? Well, the bluegill red ear sunfish hybrids, most of the ones I see occur naturally in a pond because, you know, a, a male red ear sunfish has no issue spawning with a female bluegill. But it's not common for a male bluegill to spawn with a female red ear because the female red ears are spawning with male red ears because the male red ears are ready to go all the time. <coughs> Let's see. Um, are they, they available? For, you know what? I don't know that. You know, I, I got a feeling there's a few hatcheries around that still raise some of those, but they're not, they're not a real popular sales item. Travis Paul Smith, do you still have your electric fishing boat? Do you come to Mississippi? Actually, I do. Um, actually, I sold my fit, my boat to American Sport Fish Hatchery when they bought out my pond management company. But they they bring the electric fishing boat to Mississippi several times a year. Okay, so Scott Angelico says, do you really need plants in the pond as long as you have a lot of trees in the water all the way up to the shoreline? Um... Really depends on the kind of trees. If you've got button bush, the answer is no. If you've got um, cypress trees with open roots, the answer is no. But if you've got water oaks and it's a trunk, or you've got pond cypress whose roots aren't opened up, the answer is no. And I don't see anything wrong with having a mix of both. <coughs> Let's see here. Kenny Sanderson, not sure where you are. Frank's near Shreveport, Louisiana. Kenny, Kenny's in northwest Kansas. 
Philip Minifield, often here, one of the goals for your pond when speaking of pond management tactics. Is there a guy that talks about different types of ponds? I know, for example, a trophy bass pond, but that's not what I'm looking for. Well, Philip, the way that I work at this, what I do is <clears throat> when I sit down and ask your goals, I'm not necessarily asking about fish goals, although we do pin that down. What I'll say is, Philip, I'll say, why'd you buy this land? Why'd you buy this property? Why do you want water on it? You know, and 99 times out of 100, a landowner knows the answer, may not have ever voiced it, but I'm buying water, a, a, a ranch with water on it because I want the serenity. Uh, it's because I want to eat fish. It's because I want my wife to be able to sit in a swing and read a book beside it. You know, so I drill into those goals, and once I understand the goals, then I try to get into your head the way that you think and then help create that premier environment that you're looking for. It it usually includes fish, but not necessarily. Uh, it might include water, but not necessarily because of the water, because of the water the sound makes. I've actually had people say, I love to hear water. Well, that tells me, well, we better design it where they can be close enough to electricity to pick water up, run it over a waterfall or have a fountain, you know, so when we start talking about goals, it's not necessarily pond goals, although it, it, it drills into that, it's more about why did you buy that property, and what are your expectations, and what do you see in five years, and once we see that, then we start getting down into the, to the specific goals. Here comes my friend Chris Blood with Texas Hunter Products. Bob's thanks for the wealth of knowledge. Uh oh, I scroll past it. What's the process to hire you? <laughs> you know, I never do plug myself very good, Chris. I do want to plug the Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology. There, I've got 22 videos up that are outstanding content. And you can find it by going to, I think, Pond Boss dot teachable dot com if that isn't it i'll post a link as soon as i'm finished with this show and that way you can find it i see nick peterson fisheries biologist just checked in um how, so what's the process the process to hire me is to call my office 903-564-6144 which is also the pond boss office leave a message i'll call you back and then we'll go through an interview process. <clears throat> when I know what your goals are, then if I can help you, I'll be glad to. What I'm doing now more than anything is, is I've downsized by selling my pond management business. You're going to see me in an electrofishing boat maybe 15 times a year or it used to be 115 times a year. You'll uh, see me out talking to somebody about designing a lake a lot more than I did five years ago. Y'all see that moth flying around? Looks like a dead gum bomber, but it's not. So uh, I'm happy to help you design a program to make your lakes better, but I'm probably not going to be seining any fish. I'm 65, 66. I'm done with that. Vito, thank you very much. He just put up the link. There you go. And there's, a, I think, like six different modules. But if you want to hire me, uh, call and let's talk about it. I'll return your call and we'll discuss it. If I'm the right one, we'll talk about that. If I'm not, I'll refer you. And also keep in mind that we've got the Palm Boss Resource Guide. I can't, I can't promote this enough. We've got sources from everything from aeration to fish food to uh, fish hatcheries. And this is also online at palmboss.com. You know, so I do, I do, I, I can't do it all. I don't want to do it all. So, um, I'm happy to refer you. If it's not me, I'll refer you to somebody that's really good at it. Okay, let's see here. Oh, by the way, hey, Frank, since you want to sign up for the Pondology course, hey, guys, listen to this. If you want 15% off in the coupon section on there, when you, when you sign up, it's going to say coupon code or something. <clears throat> it's it's Pond Boss. All capital letters, one word. Just put in Pond Boss, and you'll get a 15% discount. 
Now, that, that discount is for the first 20 people that sign up, and it ends on May the 7th. So if you sign up between now and May the 7th, you'll get that 15% discount. There you go. All right. Well, 7.30, I'm going to wrap it up. I can't believe my voice lasted this long. Thank heavens for cough syrup. And you guys, I always tell you how much I love you, and I appreciate you watching this show. Uh, oh, hey, next Wednesday, I'll be fishing. But there's a lodge over at Lake Allen Henry, which is southeast of Lubbock, and I'll have a couple of special guests if I can get them drunk enough to come on with me. Uh, I didn't really say that. But we're going to have some guests be broadcasting live from a lodge over there. I think it's called Woody's Lodge. So until next Wednesday, I look forward to seeing you guys again. Thanks for joining me. Adios.